guys are awesome. Man, that's what a welcome, what a greeting. Thank you, Pastor Drake. Um, I'm honored to be here with you guys and honored to partner with uh, City Church Boulder. You know, when I, when I got to meet Pastor Drake over the phone, we were just connecting, and I found out that he is a Dallas Baptist University alumni, and so am I, and we instantly hit it off. It was like, oh, man, Jesus must want us to be together and connect together, and um, and we've been partnering together that way, and so I have a message called Marks of Discipleship, Marks of a Disciple, and in it, uh, I will share parts of my story, parts of our church plant, and, and why we planted the way we planted. And it's so funny, as uh, Pastor Drake was talking about chapter 7, the book of Nehemiah, I'm one of those, when I read the scriptures and I get to the names and I just kind of flip the chat. I don't know if you guys are like that, where I'm just like, ah, oh, I can't even pronounce the names. So I'm just going to skip over this. Um, and, and what he said is so key. Um, people matter and people count. And there's just so many stories to be told of what God is doing all around the world and all through God's kingdom. And I was just like, man, if my name was in the Bible, like, that's pretty important. I would want to, I would want it named as well. So um, that, that's pretty awesome. So we're going to talk about marks of discipleship. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Luke chapter, um, Luke chapter 14. Um, these are the initial marks. And there's just some things in life that mark us right? You know, you, you, you have traumas, you have experiences, you have moments, there, and, the, and then they leave you different. And, and you're kind of the person you are because of the things that you've experienced. And one thing I remember reading in the scripture was, was that people ran into the disciples of Jesus after he had resurrected, and it said that they could tell that they had been with Jesus, like the life of the disciples were so different and it had left a mark on them that they, they resembled him. They looked like him. And sometimes the marks we take on, it could be internal, it could be external, it could be tattoos, but there's something that says, man, this is going to be different. You know, back in the day when, when, when I would come to Boulder, uh, not for Christian activity, um, it was for other things, and, and you would go into the club, and, and I lived in Denver, and I went to Eagle Crest High School, and so we would commute uh, just to party and hang out out here, and, and I would go into the club, and they would put an X on my hand when you got in, and the next day... People knew that if the X was still on your hand, that, that you had been somewhere, you probably were in the club, that, that left a mark on you. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, what are the marks that signify that you have been with him? That you're living one way today, and people are looking at you, like, but we could tell they have been with Jesus. They've been marked, that they live different. Luke chapter 14, we'll start in verse 25, and it's on the screen here. It says, now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and his mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you, Lord. We, we so love you. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people that make up this church. I thank you for the community that it's in. You love them. And you're calling them to more. You're calling them to higher. And Father, I pray as we just search the scripture and we investigate what you have to say to us this morning, I pray that you open our eyes, open our hearts to your truth 
that the spirit of many waters may flow through this room and we may be challenged, encouraged, inspired to be more like you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. What marks you? There's some initial marks of a disciple. I love that when Jesus drew a crowd, it says that he turns to them and he challenges them. You know, for us, pastors, you know, it's funny, we're doing a block party too, and we're doing a back-to-school block party in August in Denver, and I was checking our registration, and we had like 129 people registered because we give out free backpacks, and we do free haircuts, and, and you do anything for free, and people are going to sign up, right? And so there are all these people coming, and I'm thinking to my mind, like, man, how can I get them to stay, <laughs> right? right? Where are the connection cards? Where, you know, everything you're doing, like, you know, that's just how we are as pastors, as church leaders leaders you draw a crowd and you're like how can I get them to stay Jesus drew a crowd and said wait a minute who are you really after why are you really here and he begins to challenge them because to follow Jesus comes at a cost it comes at a cost and he turns around to the crowd and he challenges them about what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to follow him. You see, a first century Jew would have known what a disciple looked like. You see, we read the scripture and we think, okay, a disciple, what does that translate? Learner, student, um, but it was so much more. For a first century Jew to be called a disciple, you see, every young Jewish boy knew that you go through primary school and you learn the Torah. Every, every first century Jew, okay, I learned the Torah. And rabbis would come and they would see who's the best and brightest. Everyone would go through primary school and they would learn. And then the best and brightest would go on to secondary school and learn a trade. If you weren't good enough, you just learn a trade. <laughs> you become a fisher, you become some, a carpenter, you're not good enough. But for those that are the best and brightest, they say, hey, the rabbis would say, why don't you go to secondary school? Because there's an opportunity for you to follow in my footstep as a rabbi. And so the best and brightest would have an opportunity to go to secondary school and learn a trade. Now, once they finish secondary school, the rabbis come at the end of their graduation, and they're looking to see who's the best and brightest students. These are the ones that are going to be the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they would follow in the steps of the rabbi. And so at the end of the secondary school, there would be an invitation that goes out. Rabbis would go and find the best and brightest students that they could find to say, come follow me. And then the students would have to agree, but to follow the rabbi, meant you had to leave everything behind to be a, a, a student of the rabbi and so you would leave your trade behind you would move into the house of the rabbi and you would submit and surrender your life your mindset everything you did to follow in the way of the rabbi so when the rabbi died you would take his place that's what it meant to be a disciple that you would come fully surrendered under the theology the perspective of that rabbi you would renounce everything. And so when Jesus says you have to hate your mother, father, because there was a tradition that the rabbi-student relationship was so personal and so intimate because they were always together, that at the end, that the student, if the house was on fire, that the student would rescue the rabbi before he rescued his parents. What Jesus is saying here is, is your love for me has to grow so deep that it looks like you hate everything else. He's not telling us to actually hate our mother, father. He's not saying that. He's saying, but as a disciple, your devotion to me becomes number one. So why does Jesus turn to this crowd and give them this challenge? I believe it's the same reason why we have the scriptures now, is that there are a lot of people out there that are following Jesus that want to be disciples but have not counted the cost and have not been marked with the surrender and submission that it takes to be a disciple, to really follow him. So as people are coming in, Jesus is saying, well, I don't want you to come to me with false pretenses. And sometimes we as pastors and as churches, we so deeply want to reach people. And so we, we hey, man, your life is going to change and it's, and it's, and it's going to be great. And, and God has great things for you and you're going to be blessed and highly. You know, we, we say all the good stuff and, and sometimes we're like, okay, once we get them in there, then we'll teach them the hard stuff, right? Let me take them to the Old Testament. And we'll, but Jesus on the front end is like, listen, 
You got to renounce it all to follow me, man. You want to be Mark? You want to walk with me? You want to be my disciple? This is what it takes. You're going to have to surrender it all. That's what marks our life. And oftentimes we get the watered down version. We get the, I just want to follow my passions. I want to follow my dreams. I want to follow everything else. And I also want to follow you, Jesus. But one thing that marks us, the, the cost of discipleship, is that what you choose to follow will determine what you have to forsake. You see, when Jesus ran into Peter, James, and John, and they were fishing on a boat, and he said to them, come follow me, it says that they immediately left their nets and their boats and they followed Jesus. Why did they have to leave their career, their trade, what they have been doing their whole life? Because they couldn't take them, take it with them. You, they couldn't take their nets with them to where Jesus was leading them. They couldn't take their boat with them. And there are some things God is asking you to surrender because he's saying you can't take this with you. Where I'm taking you, what I have for you, you can't take it with you. So you got to be willing to put it down. This is what marks us. we got to be willing to put it down. Not that you have to, but are you willing to put it down? Because some things you can't take with you. And if I choose to follow him, if that's my follow, what will I forsake? There's a passage of the story of Elijah and Elisha. And God tells Elijah to go put your cloak on Elisha, and, and he's going to follow you. And it was the symbol of discipleship that he's going to come after you. And, and as soon as Elijah puts his cloak on Elisha, Elisha runs home. And Elisha's a farmer. He had an oxen, and, and he t uh, t tills the ground. What does Elisha do? He kills his oxen, he breaks up his plow, he throws a barbecue for the neighborhood and says, there is no plan B for me because what I've chose to follow determined what I chose to forsake. And God is asking you, what are you willing to forsake to follow me? What marks you? The command he gives to us is, have you counted the cost? You see, for me, when I started walking with Jesus, I was a knucklehead, man. I was a troublemaker. Uh, when my parents immigrated from Ethiopia, I was six years old, and um, my mom was doing her master's, my dad was doing his PhD, and immigrants work in two jobs, and so we didn't have a lot of adult supervision, and so I was one of those knuckleheads that just ran the streets and got into trouble in a small town in Stillwater, Oklahoma, got into fights all the time, and I got arrested so many times. At one point, my mom didn't even want to pick me up from juvie. She was like, just let send him to foster care, wherever they're going to send him. I was one of, you guys ever seen the show Scared Straight, Heard of Scared Straight? Any of y'all seen that? I, I was one of those kids that they took to prison to scare you out of going to prison, right? And, and nothing worked for me. Fast forward, I'm 16 years old. Um, we've moved to Denver. I've, I've finally, jo we've joined an Ethiopian cultural church, and we go to church camp, and, and I have this radical encounter radical encounter with the Holy Spirit. I mean, crying, snot bubbles, you know what I'm saying? The church camp experience. And, and we take our secular CDs. Man, I got my 50 cent G unit CDs. And we do like a CD burning. Y'all might not even know what CDs are, right? I'm like aging myself. And, and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to be the, the holy roller, right? Call of ministry on my life, 16 years old. Church camp is awesome. And we get back down from the mountain. And I go back to school. And that spiritual high lasted three weeks. Three weeks, and I got worse. Worse than when I was. At this point, from 16 to 18, I'm selling drugs, running around, armed robbery, gang violence. And, I mean, you could just, I was not a good person. Not at all. And finally, at 18 years old, I hit rock bottom. I get arrested. I'm looking at serious time in prison. And, you know, man... Hitting rock bottom could be the best thing that ever happened to you because you discover Jesus is the rock at the bottom. So I hit rock bottom at 18, and I'm just like, I don't know what to do, and I'm looking at all this time that I have. I, so by the grace of God, I don't have to go to jail. I get 250 hours of community service. I get this community service. I'm like, well, who's going to give me community service, 250 hours of community service? And the church my parents were attending said, we'll take you. Come on in. 
And in, those, in that year, I did 250 hours in one year, radically transformed my life. Radically transformed my life. I got to sit with pastors and people who showed me the scripture. They were giving me community service hours for just coming to church. <laughs> Bible study, cleaning toilets. This 250 hours is a lot, y'all. By the end of it, I was the youth leader. I was getting community service hours for teaching the youth. I get off probation and then I move to Denver to go into full-time ministry. What I didn't learn from my church camp experience that I got through discipleship was that you gotta count the cost. You see, some of us are just enthralled with the experience. It takes time to count the cost. It takes time of walking with Jesus, saying, man, I got to get rid of all this. I got to let this go. And sometimes it's forced on you, and you hit rock bottom, and you have nowhere else to turn. And that's one way that Jesus pulls us into himself and says, man, you're not getting it. You're going to have to forsake this to follow this. You can't have it all. And so often we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to love the world, and we want to love the church. We want to do it all. And Jesus is saying, that can't mark you. You got to count the cost it's three vivid picture he gives us in luke he says carry the cross are you willing to carry the cross matthew 8 22 and 23 it says then another of his disciples said to him lord let me first go bury my father but Jesus said to him, follow me, let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> Isn't that so cool? You know, some of us, it's not, that's not like, um, you know, that's like not Christian, he's nice. You know what I'm saying? You're thinking like, he's, hey, he's saying to him, hey, I just need to go to a funeral. <laughs> All right? Like, let me just go bury my father and mother and I'll come follow you. But the cultural perspective there is there was this need to care for your family until they didn't need you anymore to work in the trade and do all that. And Jesus is saying, whatever is pulling you away from following me, it's a dead thing. It's a dead thing. You see, we think sin is what Jesus is trying to get us away from, to forsake. But he's saying anything that is not me, I'm trying to get you to forsake. Anything that is not what I've called you to, I'm trying to get you to forsake. The rich young ruler, he says, man, I want you to sell all your, whatever you love, whatever you're going after, if it's more than me, you got to get rid of it because I want your devotion. The relationship between the rabbi and the student, it's not just about discipline, it's devotion. It's a life fully surrendered. You got to renounce it all. And that marks our life as a disciple of Jesus. There's two um, images he gives us here. He says there's a king who goes off to battle and has to make the wise choice because he only has 10,000 soldiers and he's about to face 20. And he has to go for terms of peace. And in this story, we are the losing king of our life. We are the losers on the end of our life that says we're going to have to humble ourselves and to come to terms of peace with God. Because if you don't humble yourself and you get caught, see the losing king of a battle would be forced into slavery. But if you came to terms of peace, you just have to come under the leadership of the ruling king. And if we don't have tremendous humility to say, man, I'm going to surrender and I want peace with God, um, we'll end up dying in our futile attempts to have life. I, I remember hearing a story of a lifeguard on duty, and there was a man drowning far enough away that he could see him, but he had to kind of paddle out to get to him, swim out to get to him, and there was a crowd watching this man drowning, and so the lifeguard swam out halfway, and he stopped while the man was drowning, and you could hear the crowd screaming and yelling, rescue him, rescue him, rescue him, and the the lifeguard just kind of waited a little bit. He waited a little bit. And as the man was starting to sink and go down, he finally swam out to him and saved him, pulled him off to shore, gave him mouth-to-mouth rep. You know what I'm saying? He revived him, and he was expecting some cheer, some applause, some congratulations. But the onlookers were so upset and so frustrated, they said, you coward. 
You should have went earlier. This man could have died. Why didn't you save him earlier? And the lifeguard turns to the people and he says, listen, the way that this man was fighting in the water, he was not ready to be rescued. He would have pulled us both down. I had to wait until he was ready for me to save him. You see, sometimes hitting rock bottom is us being ready to be rescued. Sometimes the worst moments in our life, the place of humility is us being ready to be rescued. And people looking at us says, God, why didn't you come earlier? Why didn't you show up? Because you weren't ready to be rescued. You weren't ready to follow him. You weren't ready to receive him. You weren't really ready to take the mark of Jesus, to be with him. You might have wanted the things of God, but you didn't want God himself. And God will allow you to fight until you're ready to be rescued, until you're ready to fully surrender your life to him. You guys still with me? How much time do I got? Amen, amen. Number two, okay, first point was a life fully surrendered. That's the first mark of a disciple. Point number two is a mind renewed. Um, when a disciple would go into the house of the rabbi, you know, everyone comes with their own perspective. You're raised in your own culture. You know, you're raised with your own way of thinking, your way of doing things. And there had to be a perspective that said, I have to renew the way I think when I come into life with the rabbi. I'm moving into his house. And, and there's something about discipleship, and, and I think we're starting to get this as a culture and as a people that a discipleship cannot be taught in a curriculum. It has to be caught through life. The early church understood that, so there was time that was spent between the rabbi and the disciple, where the disciple would witness how is the rabbi living his life day to day, and life was taught, the word was taught, questions were asked in the regular day-to-day -day life. And as a church now, we're starting to get that as we're doing life and community together, that we renew our mind and we renew the way we think. John chapter 8, verse 31. It says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. A life fully surrendered and then abiding in the word of God. These are the initial marks of a disciple because these are the things that are gonna change and transform your life. A disciple just doesn't read the scripture. You feed on the scripture. You abide in the scripture. We were doing prayer earlier, and, and I say the same thing when we do our prayer time, scripture-fed, spirit-led. Why? Because we abide in the word. That's where we remain. We feed on the word. We need it because it changes the way we think. Junk in, junk out. You got to renew your worldview because the stuff you've been taking in for all of your life doesn't line up to what God has been saying. And one problem we have as a culture and as a church is we abide in so many other things than in his word. And you almost have to be taught to go back to abiding in his word and stop abiding anywhere else. Uh, there, there was a meme um, a few months back that, that asked, what, what's something you could talk about, like list three or four things you can talk about um, without any preparation for 30 minutes? And I was thinking to myself, what are those things? Because whatever those things are, are probably places you abide. That's where you're at. And to me, I was thinking, I'm a gym rat. I love going to the gym. I love sports, basketball. I, literally, there's two channels on our TV, and it's Sports Center and, and Sports Center 2. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> that's it. Those are the only things we watch. And if you were to ask me a question about LeBron James, Steph Curry, Kobe Bryant, like, I could list stats for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just know because that's where I abide. And it just comes out of you. Where do you abide? It's not just that you check off on the list, man. Okay, I've read my Bible for today. I get it on my phone. This is where I live, and it comes out of me. For so long, the church has been abiding in different places, and we've been in a season where we've abided in politics. 
where we're just watching information on the news. And I mean, breaking news, right? I'm saying like, like it doesn't matter what you watch, CNN, Fox News, NBC, it doesn't matter. It's just that's where we've abided. And so now when life squeezes you and, and, and it becomes difficult and what, what happens, you know, when Christians are squeezed, Jesus should come out, right? Like a good tree bears good fruit. But what's happened to us because we've been abiding everywhere else, when Christians are squeezed in our country, a politician pops out. An activist pops out. You know what I'm saying? Like all of a sudden we have all the answers to everything, right? You think we just know because we've chose to abide in everything else other than his word. And he says, if you want to follow me and be my disciple, you, you got to get back to my word. You got to get back to feeding on the scriptures because that's the stuff that's going to teach you and train you in life. You know, college can teach you a skill, but the word of God teaches you life. You can go see you boulder down the street <laughs> and, and, and learn how to manage a hedge fund. You know what I'm saying? You can be an engineer. You can learn a lot of things, but if you don't know how to fix your attitude, it won't teach you that. There are some things college won't teach you because you go there to learn information. When you abide in the word, you get transformation. You are there to be transformed, right? You may learn a skill in school, but the word of God teaches you life. It transforms you. The Bible is living and powerful. So the more it gets in you, the more it changes your life when you abide in him. And it just there's just something in there that transforms you. It's tough um, being in Bible college, going into some places in seminary where when we don't read the scriptures for the right reasons, um, we miss it. When you abide in God's word, it's, it's not just to learn more information. It, it's, it's to learn him because it's a relationship. It's a devotion. And when you know him, you can walk in step and live in obedience. So, so when you learn the word, it's for obedience. But so many of us, and this is what's tough in Bible college and seminary, is that we've learned more than we obey. So, so we've outgrown our obedience. So we have all this information, but we don't actually live it out. And so you have people who understand the Greek and Hebrew. They understand the root word. They know ins and outs of scripture. But if you were to ask them, well, do you actually love your neighbor? They'd say no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like you don't have to memorize that. You don't got to get it tattooed. You just have to obey it. And when you've read it for the right reasons, because you love him, and you've learned him, you just can live it out. You can just live it out. Sometimes when we consume too much information, too much food, right, you're feeding on stuff, and you're not putting it into practice, you have, what, obesity, right? We, we, I think as a, a, a church, sometimes we can struggle with spiritual obesity, where we have all this information, we have all the resources, we have all the tools, but we're not putting it into practice, we're not actually using it, and therefore we have become, we've learned, we've outgrown our obedience to the word of God. The goal is to learn him when you learn the scripture and when you fall in love with him. Um, when my wife and I were dating, um, she was in Baylor going to Baylor, and I was in Dallas Baptist University, and I was in Dallas, I was a youth pastor, and, and so it was about two hours away from where I was at, and we would text a lot, and I wasn't a big texter at the time. You know what I'm saying? I would just text information that needed correspondence. Yes, I will be there. No. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Two, three word answers. And because uh, my wife was far away, so all we could do was talk. And when she was in class, we could just text. Um, I became a master texter. Like I would write paragraphs, you know what I'm saying? Like spell check it and then send it. And we would constantly be in communication over text. We would, we would just communicate and we'd be on the phone together. And it, and it was a beautiful thing because as she would text, um, I was getting to know her, and she was getting to know me, and, and our relationship grew because we were always in constant communication. Um, I didn't fall in love with the message. I fell in love with the person. There is a person behind the text. You see, when you open up your scripture, you're not falling in love with the text. 
but the person behind the text. There's a person behind the message. There's a person behind the word that wants to communicate to you, that wants to love you, that is falling in love with you and wants you to fall in love with him. When you abide in his word, you're getting to know him so that you can be in obedience. You can walk in step with him. These are the things that will mark your life as a disciple. You ever think to yourself, man, these Christians who gave their life, some of them, you know, you read through Hebrews chapter 11 towards the end of the text, and it talks about the way people lived in faith, that we weren't worthy of them. It was because they knew the person behind the text. They knew who they were following. Jesus had marked their life. And so whether they were fed to lions in a coliseum, whether they were hung upside down and martyred, whether they were stoned to death, they said, I will follow you wherever you go because I have forsake all else to follow you. And I know you love me and I love you and it doesn't matter what the cost is for me, I'm going to walk with you. you. You see, you can't fake that. You can't, you, can't, you can't fake that kind of Christianity. That's the kind of Christianity that when people see you, they say, man, they must have been with Jesus because it so marked their life. And as I close this morning, you see, our church plant, we planted in Green Valley Ranch to make disciples. Very organically, we started in my house about two years ago during the pandemic, praying over Zoom. And when we could start, finally start meeting, it was Easter about a year ago, we, we packed out my little house in Green Valley Ranch and we said, you know, we just want to make disciples. We want to make disciples that make disciples. We want people to come to know Jesus slowly, organically, and with nothing no other intention. We, we, don't, we don't have a big plan to plant a big church to do a big event. We're not, we're not like that at all. We didn't even have anything. Uh, you know, when we, we, when we were gathering in our house, people just brought their stuff and we, we, we were finally, we had to outgrow our house within a couple weeks and so we went to a hotel and I called a friend that was a DJ and I said, man, dude, we don't have any equipment. We don't have any mics. We don't have anything. Like, do you have anything that we could use to meet in a hotel? I mean, we could, if you could give us a discount or put us on a payment plan I we didn't have any money like nothing guys I'm, I'm like nothing and and I called Perry on the phone and and when I called him he said David since you were told me you were preparing to plant a church I set equipment aside for you for when this time would come and he gave us all our sound equipment our sound board we have a, we had a whole band the first week everything donated because people started showing up because I said, we just want to make disciples. And God has been so faithful to our church plant. Not because we want to do anything else other than just make disciples. We just want, if I, we can, our, our vision is one life at a time. We want to help one person come to know Jesus. And as we're helping one family, one life at a time, others will come to know him. Six months ago, I connect with Drake, who has the same heart and vision for this area. He says, man, we want to support you to help you plant and continue the work going. And I'm so thankful for you all because you were disciples that are making disciples, that you've taken the mark and said, we just want to see people that follow him. And my challenge for you is to be marked by him. If there's anything else that marks you, let it be that. I just want to pray for you. And if you're in here today and you say, David, I don't know if I've surrendered it all. I, I, I don't know if, if I'm abiding in the word. Like, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm really following him and if I have a passion to make disciples that are making disciples. Um, like, 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 that's just, I don't know if I'm there yet, but I want to be there. Man, as we worship and sing, would you just, actually before that, if you're in here today and you just want to go deeper, would you just stand with me? And I just want to pray for you, man. Just, just stand on up. If you're in here and you're like, man, I just want to go deeper. I want to, be, I want to, I want to make more disciples, and, and I want to be faithful to that. Man, thank you. Thank you for standing. We're just going to pray. We're just going to pray. If you're in here and you're like, man, I just want to be better at this discipleship thing. I, I want to just follow him. And let's pray together. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for the families, the people that make up City Church. 
Uh, I thank you that you love them, that you've called them to deeper intimacy with you. I pray that you mark them, God, with your presence, with your power. God, as they count the cost, as they're willing to surrender whatever you ask and lead them wherever they need to go, Jesus, I pray that you be so close to them. Lord, that you are closer than their breath. May they sense you. May they know you. May they love the love that they have for you grow deeper and deeper as they surrender more and as they abide in your word. I just bless them and I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.